Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, We pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, Number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at VXVChurch. Dot com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. All right. Good morning, VXV Church. It is good to be with you. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We made it down to verse 21 the last time we were together. That is where we will pick it up today. Matthew 7 and verse 21, as we now put a wrap on what has been a a remarkable 20-week journey uh, through the Sermon on the Mount. Now, it's pretty difficult for me to put into words what, what teaching through the Sermon on the Mount has meant to me and, and who it is I've been given the privilege to teach it to, that being you here at VXV. I could not have um, possibly imagined uh, the depth of the discovery that, that lay before me 20 weeks ago. It, it has been a, a spiritual exercise for my own soul that has been second to none. And I've heard um, the same from so many of you. It's important to me that you recognize that that you and I, as pastor and church, that that we are in this together, all right? I'm not some super spiritual Joe up here, all right? But rather, you and I are growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ together, 2 Peter 3.18. Now, this is not false humility, I do recognize there is a teaching gift here, and it is my deepest desire to dispatch that faithfully, but, but I do not teach you or speak to you as one who has arrived, okay? But rather, I teach you and speak to you as one who desperately wants to be a better man for his heavenly father and his earthly family and my church family. Uh, and this desire is not born out of popcorn. This desire is not born out of, let's see if this helps. And I appreciate uh, your patience, guys. We've been struggling with this for a number of weeks now, and we, quite frankly, don't know what it is. We've switched out everything. So let's try this. This desire of mine is not born out of a um, desire to perform somehow or, or measure up. It is a desire uh, out of an ever-increasing and growing delight and joy and marvel uh, over the glory of God. That, that is, I might become more obedient and, and more holy, that, that, that I might taste and experience a, a greater proximity to, okay, and a greater fellowship with my Lord and Savior and Maker and Sustainer. However imperfect my execution, uh, and it is most imperfect, okay? This is the raison d'etre of my existence, all right? To bring forth obedience to the words of Christ, not because I have to, because I want to. One of the corners you will one day eventually turn in your Christian experience is that obedience is the key to your joy in the Lord. I'll say it again. Obedience is the key to your joy in the Lord. Not because you're earning anything. He's already secured that for you. But obedience is the 
turnkey to your appreciation of and proximity to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the more and more that you are bringing forth obedience, the more and more you are tasting of his infinitely excellent character, the the more and more you are closing the gap between he and you, which which of course is is, is not bridgeable, this side of the resurrection, but but you can think of it this way. He is perfect and, and, and he is stationary in his perfection, okay? He is static in his perfection. He never moves off of his perfection, right? And then here are you and I, way out here somewhere at the other end of the universe in holiness, right? And and, and we're moving around. (laughs) But, but, not, not what you're sitting on. But as we move in the direction of obedience, as we move in the direction of the words of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, so so he's stationary, we're not, as we are moving towards the white hot sun of the glory of God, S-O-N, as we are getting closer to his light, more and more of that begins to to penetrate into our hearts and into our brains. And, And we are getting closer to him. We are, by obeying, becoming illuminated. As we get closer to Jesus, there is, and you know this if you've been around, right? As you get closer to Christ, there is more warmth and more peace, and more rest, and and more joy, and and just a real um, settledness that that comes to your heart. And the inverse, I find, is true as well. Where there is willful disobedience in my life, where, where, where that is where I am moving out from and away from his light and his peace, peace and and his warm and his joy. Now, it's not that there's any change in my positional standing with Christ. I'm as justified in the Lord right now today as I will ever be. All my sins, past, present, and future forgiven at that cross. But, But as I am willfully disobedient, where it is there is sin in my life, that is me somehow choosing to, to move in the opposite direction from his peace, peace and his warmth and his joy because I am saying in that moment that I am sinning that I prefer that sin to communion with Christ. And I do not like it out there, man. It's cold and dark over there. I deeply mourn any move in that direction. And and so my relationship with the Lord, my communion with God, my fellowship with Christ, the the joy that comes in that abiding, that that incomparable satisfaction that is only to be had in he who is infinitely value and worthy and excellent and, and, and beautiful, my fellowship with Christ, the quality of that fellowship is a direct function of my obedience. So here's what I'm trying to tell you. It is obedience to the words of Christ that is my ticket to closeness and fellowship and and joy with and in my creator. I don't have to obey to be justified. I don't have to obey to be made right with God positionally. He's already taken care of that at the cross. I want to bring forth obedience to the words of Christ because I long I long to be nearer and closer to who he is. Are you feeling me, man? I want to be in that orbit. I I don't want to be Pluto, all right? I want to be Mercury. I want to snuggle up and just get in there and be as close as I possibly can, dwelling in in his presence without without getting burned up this side of the resurrection, right? Now, one day... I will have a glorified body that can withstand dwelling in his direct presence. And oh, true believer, can you imagine the glory of that? Mm, I could stop and breathe that in for a long time. But here and now, this side of the resurrection, look, it is obedience that is my ticket, not to salvation. Obedience is my ticket to the sweet satisfaction of fellowship with Jesus. The Bible says you and I were made 
for that. And, and that is why pursuing or prioritizing anything above him, even experiences, that, that is a chasing of the wind. And sometimes it takes people decades to figure that out. Now, I've been careful to articulate this phrase, obedience to the words of Christ, because that is what our final passage in the Sermon on the Mount is going to attach itself to. Jesus will say, everyone who hears these words of mine, these are the words of Christ, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, he is the wise man who built his house on the rock. Again, the inverse is true. Whoever hears these words of mine, the words of Christ, and does not act on them, that does not do them, he is the fool who builds his house on the sand. If you've been around the church for any period of time at all, you're, you're no doubt familiar with this passage. And so the word of Christ now, all right, the word of Christ, what we do with the words of Christ, the word of God here in the Sermon on the Mount, these are the very last words words of Christ in this most remarkable sermon. This is how he ties it all up. This is how he shuts her down. This is his curtain call. The entire sermon, these 20 weeks for you and I, they come down to this, obedience to the words of Christ. What are you going to do with the words of Christ? So that's where we're going. Now, let me back out a bit and, and give you a bit of a um, visual feel for the rest of the sermon because we do have to back up a bit off that passage and begin with those very somber verses. Verses 21 to 23 there in your Bibles, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. Depart from me, I never knew you. You know, those fun verses, right? Now, we've alluded to them three times thus far. Uh, we've brought them into previous expositions in order to of course, build out the proper context, but we will take a closer look at that text before we close the entire sermon here with the house on the rock and the house on the sand passage. And I will tell you much more to that passage than perhaps you've imagined. Incredibly rich, rich text there. Now, when we take our time with these passages and these words of Christ. And we do, and we should. But when you spread these chapters out over a number of weeks, it is most necessary and most helpful to back out and, and look down at this deal uh, from 50,000 feet so you can keep your, your arms around the, um, the context and the flow without which you cannot fully understand the text, and we don't want to do that. So this then now is how Jesus is winding down the Sermon on the Mount. Let's take a look at the structure visually here. All right. So you remember now the teaching portion of the sermon for all intents and purposes. Christ was done teaching at verse 12. And then in verses 13 and 14, we had this extraordinary invitation right? Extraordinary invitation based on all that Christ had taught us in chapters 5, 6, and 7. It was all to lead us to this command and this invitation. Look, you enter through the narrow gate. You, you tread the narrow path. This is the way to life right here. It's not going to be easy. It is a difficult past, uh, path. He said there are few which was oligos, puny in number in the Greek. Few will find themselves on this narrow path. Why is it tough? Why is it so hard? Because there is a false gate and a wide way that is also marked this way to heaven. However, it leads to hell. And Jesus said there would be many polos in the Greek, the majority would be on that wide path. So you've got two choices, right? Wide path, narrow path. You've got two choices. And Jesus now said it would be difficult for two reasons. Number one, we saw this in verses 15 to 20. There will be others trying to deceive you. There will be false prophets. Get that study from last week if you missed it. 
An acquiescence to tolerance is a move away from the word of God. It matters very, very much what you follow and what you allow into your life for yourself and those you love and are supposed to protect. Because we live amongst a generation of Christians that worship at the altar of tolerance, this same generation has lost its capacity to be discerning and test all things by the scripture. And so one of the reasons Jesus has told us there are so many on the wide path is because others are deceiving us, okay? Now then, the second reason it's difficult to find the narrow path it's because we are self-deceived, all right? And so we've got others deceiving us, and we've got ourselves deceiving us. Another way to put this would be we've got false prophets, and we've got false professions. Now, it is these self-deceptions and these false professions of ours that we have in the text that Christ will address to close out the sermon. In the infamous I never knew you, verses 21 to 23, we have those who say, but don't do. So that's one kind of false profession. In verses 24 to 27, we've got the two builders and the two houses there. Uh, you've got those who hear, but do not do. So among the false professions, among the self-deceived, we've got those who say, but don't do. And then we've got those who hear and don't do. Are you tracking with the outline here? All right, now listen very carefully to what I am going to say next. When we talk about doing here, we're not talking about doing in order to get saved, all right? When we talk about doing, that is the evidence of those who are legitimately saved, okay? Do you understand what I'm telling you? We don't do to get saved, but saved people do. We don't do to get saved, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, but saved people do, the epistle of James and 1 John and 1 Peter, among others, right? It, it is the evidence. In, in the words of Christ all over the gospel, a tree is known by its fruit. Here's, a, here's another way you could put this. The first group, in verses 21 to 23, they have empty words, okay? The second group, in verses 24 to 27, they have empty hearts. Now, what we are going to find Christ doing here to close out the most powerful sermon ever preached is he is going to bottom line it for us. And you will not hear this text taught in a seeker-sensitive church. Okay? He's going to bottom line it for us, and what he is saying is going to be very simple. Lots of people are going to hear the words of Christ, but the only ones you're going to find in the kingdom of God are those who are trying to do it. What we have in our final study here in the Sermon on the Mount is either going to wildly encourage you or save your eternal soul as you know it. The riveting conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount begins now. So let's get after it. We go to work again here. Uh, the very last time in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Let's go. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, underline that word says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but he who does, underline that word does. This is the contrast Christ is setting out. Uh, but, but, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many, polos, the majority, will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all this cool stuff? What about all those experiences we were chasing? Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, and I never knew you. Underline that word knew. That is the key um, 
word in our text today. Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice. Now, now what does he call chasing experiences here? Lawlessness. Because you weren't seeking me. You weren't seeking holiness. You weren't after confession and repentance. You were after goodies. Christian, spiritual, 007, goodies, never knew you. Take heart, people. He calls that lawlessness. Now, we've said quite a bit about this passage over the last number of weeks. And so I, I want to be careful not to beat you over the head with it. Now, it has, however, no doubt been necessary to establish our context in chapter 7, and yet we've yet to really take the expositional knife to this text in order to rightly divide the word. So let's get after that with a degree of brevity here, and and then we'll spend um, likely the lion's share of our time on verses 24 to 27 here. I, I think the main thing of VXV I think the main thing to understand here is, again, here we have a group of people that are absolutely convinced that they are heaven-bound. No? We have a group of people, they are absolutely convinced they are heaven-bound, that they are saved, that they are going to live forever with God. If you would have asked any one of these people five minutes before this if they were saved... Each and every one of them would have said, well, of course, absolutely, yes. Here's what I find absolutely fascinating about this passage. This is the striking picture that Christ is painting here. So convinced are these individuals that notice now they are actually arguing with God. Have you picked up on that? In the very presence of God, right? Now, when is it that you and I argue? Assuming, of course, you're not one of those unfortunate individuals who has to argue over absolutely everything in life, Sarah. (laughs) Hey, she's in the nursery. Come on, I mean, when am I going to be able to do this, all right? No, I'm kidding, of course. I I I meant you, Pops. (laughs) Uh, you know, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, come on. All right, uh, but, but when is it that most of us normal people argue? Well, we are going to argue when we are absolutely convinced that we are right. In fact, let me just give you a heads up. The only time that I am going to argue with you is if I am right and you are wrong, all right? So so let's just get that out there. If you find yourself in an argument with, with me, you can know that you are wrong. Okay, so, so just know that. And so the absurdity here is that you've got deceived people in an argument with the God of all truth. What Christ is doing here is painting a very vivid picture of the depth of deception in the deceived. So deceived are they, they find themselves arguing with truth incarnate, God. Now, notice their defense here. They are not doing the will of God, but boy, they sure seem to be doing some pretty amazing things here, do they not? I mean, they're chasing all the demons out of town, right? They're performing miracles. It seems like some uh, pretty serious stuff here. Uh, Let me show you a couple of texts, and I only have time for a couple of texts here, but but let me show you these uh, that I sure wish the charismatic world uh, would wake up to. Here's one of those. Uh, This is um, the Apostle Paul speaking of the last days to the church at Thessalonica. He says, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. Who's following these lying signs and wonders? By the way, in the King Jimmy, it says lying signs and wonders with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. Who are they? Those that are following these, right? Why? Because they refused to love truth, right? The truth of the word of God and so be saved. So, So in these last days, Paul is telling us that the devil will come with his lying signs and wonders, Again, don't miss verse 10. They did not love the truth. They did not love the word of God. They loved, they chased experiences, okay? VXV, 
This is why the devil brings lying signs and wonders to keep the unwitting out of the word of God and into the devil's parlor tricks. All right, here is Jesus himself saying the very same thing. We'll see this coming up in the Olivet Discourse in uh, Matthew chapter 24 here in Matthew's gospel. Yeah, Jesus says, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is. Hey, look, this is of God over here, man. Uh, Can you see what's happening here, man? This has got to be of Christ. Do not believe it. For false Christs and false Prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. There's so much more to that text that I would love to unpack, but we don't have the time. But this should serve, I would hope, as a real heads up to us here, if you're not picking and choosing, but you are building your life on the full counsel of God, right, which we'll get to, But I would hope, as a real heads up here, that that you should understand, just because you see a person doing some extraordinary things, that is not an indication that is of God, and that is not an indication that they are right with God. How do we know if they are right with God? Again, they are doing the word of God. They are doing the will of God, which notice now, according to Christ, they are not. Now, they say that they are, but they are not according to Christ. So so notice the two contrasting key words in this text. You've got say, and you've got do or does. Many will say they are doing the will of the Father, but they do not do the will of the Father. In other words, let me translate this for you, folks. In heaven, as in the earth, talk is cheap. Right? Right? It's not important what you say. And maybe they're saying the right things, right? I mean, Lord, Lord, right? But look at the other key word Jesus is using here. It is the word does. He who does the will of my Father there. Now then, is it important what comes out of your mouth? Of course it is. Of course it is. But what is more important is what is coming out of your life. Understand that? What you do do gives credence and authenticity and bears witness to the legitimacy of what is coming out of your mouth. In heaven, as in the earth, talk is cheap. If you are claiming to have a real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, then we ought to be able to sit back and watch your life and see some measurable movement in the direction of doing the words of Christ here in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, to be sure, doing is not the cause of saving faith, but doing is the evidence of saving faith. You really can't get away from that in the New Testament. Now, it is always on this point that I will keep stopping and keep being careful that we don't swerve into the opposite error on the other side of the road, and that would be legalism. Again, you don't do to get saved. Saved people do. We can keep it that clean, okay? Listen to me, because repetition is the mother of learning. You're being the genuine article. You're you're being a true believer and not a false one. You're doing the word of God, okay? But we're not talking about perfection here, okay? Again, we all stumble in many ways. James 3, 2. He who says he is without sin lies, 1 John 1, 8, right? We are not talking about perfection, but we are talking most certainly about some degree of measurable direction. The Lord Jesus Christ is most keen on what your desires are. The Lord is always taking everything back to the desires of our heart. If you, look, if you sincerely um, desire to be holy in, in the face of your imperfect execution, That is what pleases the heart of your heavenly father, and he is going to get you there. Man, it's his promise to you. Read Romans chapter 8. You bring the desire of a burning heart to the Lord. Amazing things are going to happen, okay? 
And so let us bear in mind, it is the slow, as we always say here, it is the slow work of grace in the heart of a man or a woman, to be sure. But over time, there is most definitely to be some degree of measurable movement in your obedience to the words of Christ if you are claiming to have a relationship with him. Now, it's not that you're confessing, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ one minute and the next minute you're John MacArthur, okay? We're not saying that, all right? What we are saying is this, though. If several years ago you had some kind of a conversion experience, but between then and now, there is no measurable change in your obedience to the words of Christ, then you should not deceive yourself into believing that you have come through that narrow gate. You would have what James describes as a false faith when he says, faith without works is dead, James 2.26. Or as Johnny Mack likes to say, faith minus works is zero. Okay? We don't care what you have to say. We don't care what you profess to believe. We're just going to look at how you are ordering your life, and that is going to tell us if you are the real deal. That is what Christ is saying in this text. Now again, I also want you to mark the word many there. Now we saw this word last week. We've got polos in the Greek, mostly, largely, plenteous. We, we are talking about the clear majority here. Je- Jesus is saying, many are going to say to me on that day. Not, not, VXV, understand. He's not going to say, well, we've got a handful of Arminians over here. We've got three or four Presbyterians over here. Hey, we've got one or two Catholics and, a, and an Episcopalian over here that are deceived. No, no. As Jesus is looking over the church world, he is saying there are going to be Many that are under the deception, they are saved, but they are not. Now, in my view, here is no doubt um, the most important piece in this text. And I think really the, the key to the entire passage here. Notice that Jesus says there, I never knew you. And that word for knew there, again, key to the text, this is the Greek word gnosko. Very rich word here. And it means to know absolutely. It means to know intimately. It's built upon to know by experience. Now, now it is true that I know the top of the stove is hot because I had an experience with the stove. I got burned by that stove. And so there is this idea of experience, but it's much, much more than that. Gnosko here means an intimate experience. In other words, it's not just an awareness of, it's an intimate relationship with, okay? Let me show you some other texts in the scripture, some other uses of gnosko that you might um, get a better feel for this incredible um, piece of text we have here. Here is um, God speaking to Israel through the prophet Amos on the top there. Only you have I known. He's not talking in awareness. He's not talking about mental comprehension here. He is speaking of intimate relationship between he and his covenant people. Back in Genesis 4, when it says Cain knew his wife and they bore a son. Not, Not talking about he knew her name or knew who she was. Right? This is gnosko. This was the absolute intimate act in marriage. Now, now, jumping all the way to the end there, quickly, you remember Joseph was shocked to hear of Mary's divine pregnancy. Why? Because he never what? Knew her. He knew her not. Again, intimacy. And then finally, jump back in the middle there, John chapter 10. Jesus says of his true followers, they hear my voice and I know them. Gnosko. That's gnosko. Now, here then in our text, it's rather the opposite, is it not? Jesus is saying, I never knew you. Gnosko. Jesus is saying here, there was never an intimate relationship here, guys. Now, you may have had an experience with your church, You may have had an experience with your religion. 
You may have had an experience with a building that you showed up in once a week, but you never had a relationship with me. You may have had a relationship with experiences, but you never pursued me. You never had an intimate relationship with me. You do not know me. These are hard words, but we must be faithful. Now, I do not believe that of the two sets of warnings, bless you, of the two sets, that was really a cute sneeze, by the way. Raise your hand. Who, who sneezed that? Was that you? All right. There are sneezes that aren't so cute, right? <laughs> Where the heck am I here? All right. So, I... I I do not believe that of the two sets of warnings that we have before us today, that this one in verses 21 to 23 is going to carry as much weight for us at VXV as is the one to follow in verses 24 to 27 concerning building our house on the rock or the sand. Now, I don't mean that for all of us, but by and large, I don't see very many of you chasing after signs and wonders and experiences. I don't see most of you falling for the parlor tricks of the devil. I don't see you attending leg lengthening services, all right? I don't see you standing in a long line to get prophesied over so you can be all caught up in self for the next six months and out of the word of God. By and large, I, I, the group that God has, as, has assembled here, I, I believe, is too well equipped in the word of God to fall for that crap, Okay. But that doesn't mean that many of us haven't come out of that kind of environment because many of us have because that's largely the landscape that we're dealing with here in the churches in southwest Michigan. I think the greater warning for us here at VXV potentially is what we are going to read next. Again, this text is at 24 to 27 is going to be anchored in what are we doing with the hearing of the words of Christ. We're about to read everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, and then everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. And so what we're dealing with next now is what to do with the hearing of the word of God. And this, I think, is, is a little more in our wheelhouse, all right? I think this hits a lot closer to home uh, than does you and I chasing goofy experiences. In the former environment, verses 21 to 23, you are chasing experiences precisely because you are not hearing the word of God, all right? All that to say, heads up, VXP, because I believe this one is going to hit a bit closer to home, and, and I would guess for you and I, just super profitable. So, so rich is this text now. Mark it very carefully, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them or does them in most of your translations may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, or does not do in most of your translations, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And notice the same storm is coming. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell, but not only did it fall, notice there for emphasis, and great was its fall. All right, now, now this metaphor would have carried immediate weight, the, the immediate weight of, of reality with the original hearers. Again, not so much for us, unless of course you live in Southern California where there's an abundance of earthquakes and floods. You build a home in Southern California, you're going to need a good foundation. And first century Palestine wasn't all that different. In fact, the climate was very similar to Southern California, very dry, very arid for the most part. Uh, and when it rained there in Palestine, the land could really only hold so much water. And so uh, under flooding conditions, some of these guys were losing their homes. Now, what strikes me immediately as I read this passage are the number of similarities between the wise man and the foolish man right? They are both hearing the words of Christ. They are both building a house, which means they're both building a life. They are both building upon a foundation. 
though the foundations are invisible, isn't that interesting? As you and I scan across this room at our brothers and sisters. Most of us do not know the spiritual foundations that are underneath one another, do we? So be gentle. But we have two men hearing the words of Christ. We have two men building out their lives, and we we have two men building upon a foundation. And may I add a forethought here, okay? It is at once evident that they are building their house in the same location. Because the same storm is going to hit both houses. <laughs> this, this is fascinating. There's much more to this passage than meets the eye VXV. Jesus has set this up so that you might realize true believers and false believers are living side by side one another, even in the same church. This is why we must minister to one another. This is why we must continue to foster gospel community. You can't see the foundation, and maybe that's another Bible study. So, lots of similarities. Now then, what is the only difference? It is the foundation, right? The wise man is building his house upon notice, not a rock, but the rock. Isn't that interesting? And the foolish man is building upon the sand. Isn't it interesting, you know, if you go over to the Middle East, which probably not going to happen this week, right? But over there on the east side of the Jordan River, there are two cities there. Uh, One is Ammon and the other is Petra. Uh, They offer a very um, interesting contrast akin to our text here. Uh, Many of you have heard of Petra. Uh, It is um, known as the Rock City or the Rose City because of the shade of the stone. Fascinating history. Uh, Petra is a city literally hewn out of stone, made of rock. I I think that would be super cool to see. Uh, I read this week, actually, in the National Geographic online, that there's actually a 73-year-old guy living there in the rocks. I imagine that would be a hard life. Now, um, Over in Ammon, that dry sense of humor, I suppose, (laughs) you know this lady's thinking, what in the world am I doing over here? This does not look like the Wild West to me. Should have went to Petra. And that is, well, sort of what the Lord is saying here. Now, let's pop the hood on this text. And so again, isn't it interesting, and we said this two weeks ago, The Lord keeps it simple for a man, doesn't he? Doesn't give us 30 choices, right? Doesn't give us a baker's dozen. Doesn't even give us three or four choices. The Lord gives man, once again, only two choices. The Bible puts two trees in front of us, two gates in front of us, two roads in front of us, and now here, the Lord is putting two houses in front of us. And of course, the house is speaking to your spiritual Life. You are building your life on one of two foundations according to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? You, you are building your life on the rock or you are building your life on shifting sand. Now then, the $64,000 question that should be on all of our minds is, okay, what is this rock? Okay, I need to know, what does Jesus mean by the rock? If the wise man is going to build his life out upon this rock, we probably need to know exactly what it is Jesus intends to say here. Now, there are those that will say, well, the rock is Jesus Christ. Psalm 18, Psalm 62, the Lord is my rock, and I would not disagree with that. But I think there's quite a bit more depth to this here which Jesus himself will confirm in a minute. We could also just say the rock is God. But so were the Pharisees. So let me take you over to a familiar exchange here where Jesus is confronting his disciples a little bit further into the Gospel of Matthew. We'll get to this in chapter 16. Here's the text. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Oh, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, And this is what Christ would build his church on, this confession. 
Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You could not know this apart from my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates will not prevail against it. Now, and there are many who get this wrong, particularly the Catholic Church that thinks Peter was the first pope, all right? But what is the rock here? Well, what is the rock that Jesus says he will build his church upon? Is it Peter? No, no. That is Petros, a piece of the rock, a pebble, a boulder. The rock Jesus is building his church on is the confession of Peter that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That word for the rock, the confession that that the church is built on, that is the Greek word, surprise, Petra. And it means literally a mass of rock. It means a rock bed foundation. Listen now. This is the word of God that the Father gave to Peter. Flesh and blood did not produce this word. And for that, for that matter, flesh and blood did not reveal to you that Jesus is the Christ. That was a gift that the Father revealed to you. That's another Bible study. But the rock bed foundation that Jesus is building his church upon was the word of God that the Father had given to Peter. It was the confession of the truth of the word given to Peter. That is what Jesus is saying here. I will build my church not on Peter, not on the man with the sin nature, not on the flawed human being, but I will build my church on this confession, on this word. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Clear enough? All right, now then, what is the word that we find Jesus using here in our text? Again, not for a rock, but the rock. It is Petra. You see, the Petra of Matthew 16 is the word of God. The Petra here in Matthew 7 is also the word of God. Now, super important that you have that depth and that foundation for this text, but does Jesus, in fact, say as much right here in the text? Indeed, he does. Jesus says quite plainly there, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. Such a man has built his house on what? The rock. What is the rock? He defines it right there in the text. These words of mine. They are the rock. Very simple here. This is not complicated. If you listen to his words, that is the rock that you are building on. Now, the reason I have belabored this point is because I want this crystallized in your brain. I want this to be unambiguously clear to you. The rock here is obedience to the words of Christ. Obedience to the word of God. Let's say it one more time for good measure. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, obeys them, He's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. My words, the Sermon on the Mount. So the rock then, VXV, is undisputedly obedience to the word of God. Now, you can argue with me, but this will be one of those times you're wrong. (laughs) Now then, what is the sand? We've got a couple of groups over there in the sandbox. But, But the sand, of course, would be The unstable ground. So the rock, obedience to the words of Christ. The sand, the unstable ground of human philosophy. The shifting sands of the opinion of men. The fickle and fruitless chasings after signs and wonders and visions for the sake of the experience alone. Never pausing to see if they are of God or the devil. 2 Thessalonians 2, Matthew 24. We've just been through those texts. Those were one of the groups there in verses 21 to 23. Uh, one of probably the larger groups in the sand crowd. But, but again, the, the, you just need to know this. There are people that want the power. Okay? I think we know that. that they want all the, um, uh, the spiritual juju. Okay, they they want the spiritual mojo, but they are not interested in ordering their lives after the holy standard of God. 
and therefore there is no true power. Of such men, Paul tells Timothy, um, yeah, having a, they, they have a form of godliness, but denying the power there are from such men turn away. They, they, they don't want Jesus. They want what Jesus, they want what they think Jesus can do for them. They want the goodies. And so they're off chasing lying signs and wonders, oblivious to even the idea of confession and repentance and pursuing holy living. They are a sham building their house on sand. Now, the other large group on the sand, and here's where I think some of us need to be careful, they would simply be those who take their faith with a grain of salt. If you're looking at their lives... Sure, you'll see them in church on Sunday, but if you were to follow them around the rest of the week, you're probably not going to see a whole lot of evidence of their Christianity. As James says, they hear the word of God, but don't do the word of God. They are hearers, but not doers. Just just go ahead and do whatever you want to do, right, without a whole lot of thought to the word of God and his program for their lives. In, in, in short, they, they want a savior, but they don't want a lord. Okay. These are people that really don't want to come under the lordship of Christ. They, they might show up at church, but they still want to live on the wide way. And by the way, there are a whole host of land agents selling lots on the sand. Do you know who they are? They are the false teachers we spoke of last week in verses 15 to 20. They would love to sell you a parcel of sand to build your life on. They would love to get you on that wide way where you're not thinking about holiness. You're just thinking about stuff. Plenty of sand lots on the market over there on the wide path. And because there are so many, you can get into one of those pretty cheaply. The narrow path, I'm going to cost you. So let's, let's put this on the ground uh, and, and try to, to just look at this very plainly and very simply, okay? The life of the wise man is built on obedience to Christ. That is the rock. The life of the foolish man is built on what seems right to a man. That is the sand. What does the Bible tell us? There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to what? Death. And so as we continue to unpack and exposit this incredibly pregnant passage and seek to be faithful to it, allow the Spirit of God to convict you. Consider what we are going to see, and in the quietness of your own hearts this week, you ask the Lord which of these two builders would more closely align with you. And then you pray about the answer that comes back to your heart, and you come and see Mike and I. We would love nothing more than to minister to you. So let's stay with the metaphor of Jesus and see if we can build this thing out to where it is that we need to go. There is always tremendous depth to the imagery that Christ chooses, always, every time. There is nothing insignificant about the word of God. And so what I should think we could all understand is this. That building upon the rock is going to be far more difficult than building on sand. Isn't it? I mean, chiseling away at a rock in order to lay a proper foundation, that is going to be a lot harder than digging a foundation in the shifting sand, right? I mean, opening the Word of God, digging into the Word. People don't do this because it takes work, all right? And then they want to argue without knowledge. It's dumb, all right? Look, you open the Word of God, digging into the Word of God, parsing and prying open the sacred scriptures to understand the mind of God and the will of God. As Paul uh, said to Timothy, brother, brother, be diligent, okay? Be diligent. You remember Christ in Luke 16? Strive to enter the narrow path, like agonizomai, where we got our word agony from, strive, right? Be diligent. 
to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Otherwise, shut up. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and, and Philetus. Oh, well, now, hey, Paul, are you calling out false teachers by name there? Today, we would say, well, you know, that's just not loving to pick on all Hymenaeus and Philetus. I mean, I always thought that Phil was harmless. Such a nice smile. Please. But what we're saying here is, look, there is work to this, VXV. There there is a cost to this. It's a lot harder to labor over the rock than it is to play in a child's sandbox. I mean, sand is the easiest stuff in the world. You move it all over the place, right? I mean, is that not why we let our little kids play with it? Now, of course, we hate cleaning them off afterwards. It's in the, right? It's in the socks and the shoes and the pockets, all sorts of unsavory places. Makes me wonder and marvel over how the Lord looks at cleaning up you and I. There's a difference. He delights in it. Isn't that good news? Micah 7, 18, God delights in cleaning you up. God delights in giving you mercy. He delights in extending to you his loving kindness. Oh, how infinitely higher he is than we. But it would be my guess for a number of us, if you are allowing the the Spirit of God to speak to your heart through his word, it would be my guess that there is an invitation here this morning to get out of the sandbox of our spiritual infancy and biblical illiteracy and begin to start building our lives upon the rock of the word of God. If that is your desire, you are in the right building. But we should know, man, look, to live a life in obedience with the words of Christ, it is a hard life, all right? You are going to have to go against your sin nature. You may have to go against family. You may have to go against friends. You are going to have to learn how to examine your own own heart instead of constantly examining others and you are going to learn to have to learn how to die to yourself in the preference and elevation of others needs before your own these are hard things for sinful people to do man they're hard things for sinful people to do it takes a real pushing back and down against these sin natures of ours it's not a giving in that's easy It is a pushing back in the legitimate power of Christ because you know the joy that's at the end of an easy road. Now, an easy life is to live a life where you don't pay any attention to the words of Christ. You just do whatever your flesh wants. Blame everybody else for your problems. Why in the world would I want to search my own heart? That's no fun. I'd rather blame other people and then, I don't know, maybe take my ball and go home. Do you ever notice when there's a conflict in a church, people will go to a different church? Get out of the sandbox, man. Do gospel community. Forgive. Have the Lord search your own heart and move on. Restore. Extend mercy. Do the gospel. So Mike and I always tell everybody when we sit with new folks in the church, well, man, we're going to offend you at some point which I seem to pull off just about every week. But that's how you know I'm doing my job. All right, where in the world am I? Okay, but notice the warning here, guys. Notice the warning here. Every person is building, all right? You're building. When you leave the doors of this church, this week you are going to be building a life. And you are either building that life on the rock, which is obedience to the words of Christ, or you are going to be building upon the sand, which is you doing life your way and not God's. You're doing whatever seems right to you. And again, the Bible says that is the way of death, Proverbs 14, 12. And that is exactly what Christ is saying here. Notice VXV, there is a storm coming to all of us. Don't live in pretend land, all right? The rain, uh, yeah, 
my sentiments as well. The rain and the floods and the wind, there is a storm coming to all of us. There is a storm coming for the billionaire, and there is a storm coming for the penniless man. But every person here is going to face the storm coming and revealing what it is that you have built your life upon. And so we're back to where we started. It all comes down to obedience to the words of Christ. Now, clearly here, God is speaking of the storm of his divine judgment. There is a day of reckoning coming. You know this. Where the wheat will be separated from the chaff and the sheep will be separated from the goats. And notice what he says there if you are building your life on the sands of human wisdom. The foolish man's house will fall and not just fall. Notice there, but great was the fall of it. This is how he's ending the sermon, guys. He's getting attention. Christ is speaking of the long-term storm of divine judgment that is going to come to every human being on this planet. The rain and the winds and the flood of God's judgment will one day reveal what we have built our lives upon. And if you have built your life upon the the rock of, of obedience to Christ, you will stand and enter a glory. Unspeakable. That narrow path we talked about is going to open up into this enormous vista, this panorama of glory that you never thought possible, whereas the wide path is going to funnel down to eternal separation from God. Jesus has delivered this incredible sermon, this remarkable invitation, and he does not want to see anyone choose foolishly. And so he closes his sermon right here, and his closing is, what are you going to do with these words of mine? What are you going to do with the words of Christ? This is where the Lord ends, leaves, parks the Sermon on the Mount. Notice the reaction now, finally this morning, verse 28. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed. Isn't that an understatement in the English? The crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes, their Pharisees, their scribes, their rabbis would always have to quote the authority and the precedent of another rabbi. Not Christ, he just said, I say to you. You heard it said, I say to you. They are Amazed. Now, th- this word for amazed here, it means quite literally to be smacked upside the head. Okay? This is ekpleso, very strong word in the Greek here. It means literally to strike a blow, to drive out, to shock one from self possession. That's the astonishment that's being spoken of here. Very interesting choice on the part of our Lord. You could say Jesus is quite literally trying to scare the hell right out of these guys, right, that have been gathering and crowding around the disciples as Jesus wraps up the sermon. Again, in our vernacular, again, smacking upside the head is probably the closest thing I could come to this Greek word. They are astonished, they are amazed, but ekpleso This takes the sentiment to the next level. And I think this is really, this is why Jesus ended this way. I I think this is really what some of us must need. And and probably all of us to some degree, we, we need to be awakened from our slumber. So let's land the plane. Look. And at one point or another, you are going to have to understand this is real. And I think most of you do, or you certainly wouldn't come here. At one point or another, you're going to have to understand, look, this is real life. What am I going to do with the words of Christ? Am I playing church? Am I playing Christian? Or am I really interested in, in growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? Because what Christ is saying here is, look, 
Talk is cheap. How you live your life is going to reveal who and what you are building your life upon. Listen very carefully. Again, you don't do to get Christ, but people that have Christ eventually do. What the Lord is saying here is simple. You are going to know whether or not you have a saving knowledge of Christ by how you choose to build your life. Again, I would add the caveat. Please understand it is the slow work of grace. And some of you right now that are in here, you're newer to the faith. God is drawing you in. He's beginning to reveal his glory to you. Man, I'm so glad you are here. Keep coming. Keep learning. There is nothing more satisfying than the glory of God. It is far more infinitely beautiful and excellent and worthy than all of this other garbage out there. You will know that one day if you be his. But do not mistake the warning here. If you have been professing to be a Christian for years and there is little or no fruit in your spiritual life, there is little or or no ordering your life after the words of Christ. If your life is not under the lordship of Christ, then please, brother or sister, do not deceive yourself into thinking you're Christian. Come and talk, and we can figure this thing out. That is what Christ is saying in the text. I'm not sure how he could be any clearer. Now, better you hear that from me today. While there is still time to examine yourself than to hear it in the day of judgment, I never knew you. Where any hope for change at that point will have been expired. All right? Better you hear it from me now than to tread that path of false security. It will crush you. I don't want that for anybody in this room. So let us end where we began. Now now look. Christ was very deliberate in how he ended this thing. We should know, absolutely, we should know what we've been saved from, okay? We must know what we've been saved from that we might appreciate the uh, galactic, extraordinary, condescending grace of God. That, That must be part of the equation. To know what we've been saved from, that must be part of of growing into holiness. But the the longing and the the desiring and the and the delighting and really the the joy that drives the glad-hearted life of the Christian. That's why I began our time the way I did today. That comes not so much from what we've been saved from, but what we are being saved to, okay? We're not just being kept from hell. We are being ushered forth into joy and joy inexpressible and full of glory, as Peter would say in 1 Peter 1. Do you think the words of Christ are bringing you somewhere? Yes, they are. Man, I know this has been tough. It needed to be tough, clearly for some of you, but for all of us, do not forget. Don't you dare forget where this is going. I will pound this slide in front of you until I stop breathing and turn cold and fall over. These things, this is Jesus speaking. These things I have spoken to you. Why? So that I'm gonna hit you over the head with a bunch of rules. So I could deny you real, no, no. So that my, like not this other inferior temporal crap, like my joy may be in you. And and, and not just my, but your joy would be made full. I am telling you, everything outside of Christ is smoke and mirrors. It's smoke-filled coffee house crap. It's inferior It's the wide path. This is the narrow path. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is what? There it is again. The fullness of joy in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Tough text. Let's close with a word of encouragement. Now, I I know there are a number of families here You have been beaten beyond understanding. 
I think of the Schetzels and the Wilkinsons and the Shippies, to name a few, Mike and Tonda, Bill and Janet, Nate and Andrea. I know there are many, many others, but, but look, so many of you, you have gone through or are going through heavy stuff. But the fascinating thing is you're still here. Do you understand how that blesses us? You are still standing. Do you know why you are still standing? Because you have built your life upon the rock of obedience to the words of Christ because you know, and this is where good theology comes home to roost, because you know that everything that you and I go through, that, that there is an eternal purpose for it and in it that God is achieving an eternal glory for you that no light, temporal, momentary affliction can touch. You know this because you know that one day your testimony will be, and if you don't know this, you need to know this, one day our testimony will be, behold, he does all things well. All right, VXV. Here endeth the lesson, right? That, that is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. What are you going to do with the words of Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that you are relentless in your pursuit of us and you know the deception we fall under. God, I pray for walls to be busted open. I pray for false security to be exposed. I pray for those who are yours to be wildly encouraged that you are so relentless in pursuing their joy. God, thank you that you just know us. You know us intimately, and yet, even as we are, you love us so. What a mind-blowing reality. God, I thank you that, as Jonathan Edwards was fond of saying, that your mercy is equal to your exaltation. As high as you are, so are the same dimensions of your mercy to us. That ought to comfort the socks off of each and every one of us. Lord, you are merciful, and you do not do that begrudgingly. You delight in giving us mercy. Help us tear ourselves from the wide way. Help us tread that narrow path where there are treasures infinitely better and more satisfying than the ones on the wide way that are duping us, robbing us of our joy in you. Thank you for this incredible sermon on the Mount of Christ. And Lord, I pray that um, as these days and weeks pass, that you would just sow your word into our hearts in, in, in a way that, that will just transform us. And so God, we love you. We love you. We love you. We can't wait to see what you have for us and the rest of this gospel. Thank, thank you for being a faithful daddy. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, amen. amen. Let's worship.